YouTube and yep, let's do it. I'll let them all in. All right, it has been done. All right. Welcome everyone. Oh my gosh, what a great crowd. I can't believe it. Thank you all for joining San Francisco Public Library's virtual library for this amazing event. Uh, right now, book launch, Writers of Color, Essential Truth, the Bay Area in Color. And yay, Shiz and everybody, I'm so happy for you all. I'm Anissa Malady, one of the librarians at San Francisco Public. It is Summer Stride. Don't forget to do your 20 hours of reading. Get that amazing, iconic San Francisco Public Library tote bag with the amazing artwork from Kehlani Juanita, a Bay Area native and now Chronicle published author and illustrator. Yay for her. We want to welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we reside in our beautiful Bay Area. The library is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members from these nations with whom we live together. And we encourage you to learn more about first person culture and land rights. I'll place a link into the chat box that has a link to tonight's event and to everybody's, um, you know, all the library's resources as well as to right now's resources, but has a great list for first person culture. Uh, we do have the Northern California Book Awards coming up on July 11th, so please come around for that. Some of our best here in the Northern California. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to turn it over to Shizue Siegel, who is the founder and director of Right Now San Francisco Bay. And she has supported San Francisco Bay areas and artists of color through workshop events and anthologies since 2015. Shizue Siegel, everybody. And I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over. Okay. And let's give us all a big hand. I'm so happy to see you all. I just, uh, there are so many talented people in the Bay Area. And I still, I mean, it's like when I say to people, you know, we're 60% of the Bay Area. I still can't believe how many people uh, are surprised by that. And I say, yeah, well, you know, I guess, uh, you know, we're invisible, we're essential, but invisible. It's like street lines, uh, street, uh, street lights and fire hydrants, right? Bus boys, bus drivers, security guards, nurses. Yeah, we're all that. And we get taken for granted and we're essential, but we're, we're also a lot more than that. And one of the things that, that drives me to do this work, and let me tell you, it's, it, it makes me insanely busy. And sometimes I get really crabby when I, I don't uh, get enough rest and I, I don't get enough time to just walk around and enjoy nature. But it's, there's so many amazing people in the world doing so many amazing things. And it just, it's such a joy, you know, uh, to interact with you all. Uh, so, uh, and I'm sitting here in my Richmond district, you know, Western San Francisco um, office. And I'm looking into, you know, that secret green heart of San Francisco backyards. And I'm looking at the willows swaying and I'm looking at the Dudleya and, uh, and um, just really grateful that um, I'm a guest on this unceded ancestral homeland. And I take my responsibility, uh, you know, to carry on that stewardship as much, you know, to my ineptability and to honor the original stewards of stewards of the land with gratitude and solidarity, seeking to restore balance and harmony within ourselves, with each other, and in community. And I think a lot of you feel the same way, and that's why we are a community, as busy as we are, and as seldom as as uh, we're able to interact with each other um, in these crazy times that sense of community, that sense of a bond, this collective, um, I don't know, sense of mission or responsibility, um, a collective love that we have. Um, I feel that it's really strong and I'm really grateful for it. So um, yeah, the vitality of the San Francisco Bay Area arises from its diversity 
we are 60% of San Francisco's population are people of color. 60% of the greater Bay Area's population are people of color. I think the only county that is still majority white by one or 2% is Marin. So, uh, you know, I think as usual that San Francisco is leading the way and we are what the country is going to look like, uh, you know, in, in, in a decade or two. And I'm sorry that some people are unnerved by that and are resisting it, but I think we can all say, you know, it's aside from, you know, the, the high rents and this and that and the injustices that we have to fix, the fact that we live here with such amazing people is, is such a blessing. Um, so anyway, uh, and the other thing is that, you know, the pandemic kind of shook a lot of people to the core and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor shook a lot of people, but a lot of people I know it's like, so what else is new, you know? Racial violence and prolonged uncertainty, that's what we live with. Turbulence, uncertainty, and, and loss, you know? And we have learned how to live with that. And I think a lot of times more than cope, it deepens us, it enlarges our souls. It, 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 it brings us uh, compassion and gratitude. And um, uh, for me, that's what the book is about. Um, so this book includes poetry, prose, and visual art from 130 contributors, um, Black, Brown, Indigenous, Asian, Asian American, immigrants, Buddhist, Muslim, straight, queer, differently abled. There's so much diversity. So um, the first set is going to be um, eight writers, um, five minutes apiece with no introductions. Their bios will be uh, Kevin is going to put the, their bios in the uh, in the chat because um, I wanted to have you know more readers rather than spend too much time talking. Um, so um, next up is is will be uh, Kim Shuck and then uh, Vanessa Diaz Cabrera, Carla Brundage, Tamina Khan, An Bui, Andre Lamont Wilson, and Crystal Rica Perkins. And then we'll have um, three artists uh, showing their work and, uh, and, um, and talking about it. Um, Cindy Shi, Lorraine Bonner, and Mark Harris. And then the second set will be Dena Rod, Francie Covington, Karina Muniz Pagan, Kevin Madrigal Galinda, uh, Lena Begonia, Max Leung, Venus Zathuro, Noble and Yeva Johnson. Uh, so this is the book launch for Essential Truths, the Bay Area in Color. Um, it's 200, uh, 324 pages, 100 of them in color. Um, there's some gorgeous artwork in here. Uh, and um, you can find it online. Um, on our website and Kevin will put in the link for that. Uh, and you can also find it at something like 14 bookstores already. Uh, you know, I, uh, this is my fourth anthology. So a lot of the, um, the, the booksellers, independent booksellers know me um, already, but they're so excited by this. They took, they took one look at the cover and, you know, instead of, instead of taking yeah, three to five books, they're taking five to 10. So I love the fact that they're excited about it. I think there's a lot to be excited about. Anyway, so I'm gonna read a little bit of um, some excerpts from uh, uh, a poem of mine <laughs> that I put in the book, even though it still needs work. But anyway, uh, City Snapshots, Spring. Time remains elusive. Sense and schedule, virus scattered, but meaning is crystal clear. Earth and sky are calling us to remember who's in charge. Skies unload after winter drought upon a super bloom of spring. A wealth of Dudleya and Acacia flourish alongside a proliferation of tents, mushrooming, 
mushrooming as the world turns upside down and backwards. Celestial cycles grind on, earthbounds and monoliths, pyramids and skyscrapers. Humanity's been here before. How the mighty rise and fall, but the poor will endure. Can we bridge the salt of the earth to stars in our eyes? Everlasting gold in the heart? In my neighborhood of stud, stubborn weeds, did COVID come just in time to save, save us from total eradication, preserving the last of the grit from million dollar scrubs of virgin olive oil, oatmeal, and sage that slather, slathered on by the pampered few who can afford to bathe their skins with what lesser folks could eat? Will the virus slow them down like the bursting of dot-com one or the 1989 earthquake? Coastal fog used to be enough to keep away those who did not love this land. Fog burst against our cheeks, reminding ships at sea and landlubbers alike that we are all adrift on life, reality rising and falling, heaving and lulling by turns. There are no guarantees, only the invitation to risk. We are a hardy people, buckwheat and sorrel, dandelion and succulents. Look down your nose at us. Indulge yourself elsewhere with showy blooms and gourmet grazings. We are a plain people whose meager dollars sent a generation to college so they could look down on us too. see. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I think that, um, Anissa, I wonder if we can um, change the screen so we don't have the library symbol um, on screen. Um, it would be nice to be able to see the readers. Um, the library symbol is in the right, the bottom corner, so it's not really showing. Oh, all right. So maybe it's just the view that I'm looking at. Huh. It might just, it might just be yours because we, we could all see you while you were reading. So I think. It oh, be okay. Huh. All right. That's weird. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, that's great then. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, and I don't know how the other readers feel but and I know that for a lot of people you know it's the, it's the end of the day and and you know we want to just kick back in our messy apartments and whatnot but I think the readers do really appreciate seeing you guys and feeling like we're actually communicating with folks um, and um, we love the feedback and response so uh, yeah do the jazz hands or the finger snapping, you know, put your favorite lines in the chat, you know, let, let, let the readers know um, uh, uh, how, you, how you feel about them. So with that, Kim Shuck. Hey, it's really exciting to see so many beloved people in the Zoom. This is called protest. This is where the tattered banner hangs, taken by freeway weather, like feet slipping between chill sheets, like hope, song of no dreams. Have you, have you heard music? Music that didn't hand you a memory, feathers in the left hand, feathers in tremble, moth against glass, banner, wound into the chain link, wound in wild weaving like feet sliding over unfinished floorboards, an idea of floorboards, a slow polish, step and step, bringing up the grain, tree life written in dark ridges, dark ridges the night foot cannot read. Have you heard the music? The music that keeps your memory? Is your banner hanging there, woven into the metal webbing over the freeway? And I am going to read short because that is often useful in a long reading. So thank you all. Thank you, library. Thank you, Shiz. It's a beautiful book.
Thank you, Kim Shuck. Um, you are one of the, the most generous, egoless people I know. Um, we're blessed to have you in the community. Um, okay, Vanessa Diaz Cabrera. Hi. Um, this poem is called Snakes in the Garden. Between weary eyes, tear ducts run dry, consuming ballots, watching numbers filter. Democracy exists on CNN, between blues, reds, and purple. On Univision, they can't escape screens. Jorge Ramos, hunched over tweets. Media eats media. I eat democracy with my eyes, feeling the edges of the thing that hides underneath. They say this is a thing of third world countries, boarded downtowns protecting leather purses and Apple stores. It is third world to protect material goods, plague the people of towns with wars. It is the same taste, American democracy, puppet governments, gleaning fruit from trees, eyes that never thought they would see snakes in their own garden. Maybe, maybe it is the lie we tell ourselves to believe we are free. Thank you. And this is my second poem and will be my last poem. This one's Ars Poetica number two. I want my words to dance in your heart. Skin unpeel and let the words set the rhythm. I want words of resonance, humming, thrumming across a page near you. The words of my dreams, negligently cared for, but always loved, fixtures of my life. El Salvador, ghosts, lakes, birds, all the women and none of them at all. The way I look at you with love, amass words I could never tell you. These words, I dedicate to you, all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, next is uh, Carla Brundage. Thank you. Um, day, this is called Love, Death, and Distance. Day 34, my father has COVID-19. We are on the phone. I can imagine his frail body leaning stiffly against the hospital bed rail. Everything in the room is dull blue and gray, like his eyes, the hospital blanket, the half open tied robe, his house shoes. On the phone, I can hear him opening and closing his mouth, gasping silently like a fish, hooked on its way to be sliced. He would say, I wish I could download my brain. My own brain spins to receive this, knowing he has not ever used a computer. Yes, I say. I keep imagining this phone line is like a connection between us. When I close my eyes, he says, I can see it. There's a long pause. I can see the connection. I close my eyes. I was wondering, he resumes, do you know where we could get any LSD? LSD, I ponder. He responds before I ask, well, we could take it together. Oh, I say, I know what my father believes about LSD, him having spent most of my teenage years on the truth serum as he used to call it. What made you think of that, I ask. Well, it's a way to connect, you know, an opening of the minds. I think about how long he has had that thought stirring in his head, how many years it has been lingering there. My father, pioneer wasp, married to a dark-skinned Alabama woman in 1964, how they of his generation believed that LSD was the portal to a new way of being, of blending races, of overcoming prejudice. Now, so many years later, he is asking me, what could he have told me, his three-year-old daughter, about why her daddy and mommy were not together anymore? He says, 
I did not know what to say. And then I felt so much shame. All I could say was we did not love each other anymore, but that was not true. I'm trying to process these feelings of longing from my dad, how much he still loves my mom and how he could never let go of that ever. Not that I wanted him to, but all the anger, all the wasted time. I do not know what to say, all of the waste. What were they doing, especially my dad? My mom, she built a life. There's nothing she can really regret. She moved on, but my dad stayed stuck in time despite the LSD and the truth serum. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you, Carla. I was so moved when you submitted that piece. There's so much honesty and poignancy in, in that piece. So thank you for sharing it. Um, okay, Tamina Khan. Are you here, Tamina? Yes, yay. Okay, there we go. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shizue. I'm so honored to be part of this anthology and um, wow, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and to be um, in such gorgeous, illustrious company um, tonight. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to indulge me with a short poem. Today is June 30th um, and on this day in 1996, um, a guy named Charles Hutchins and I uh, declared our love, our love for each other in at a big Indian wedding in Oakland. So, um, and we're still here. So, <laughs> so this is a poem. This is a poem for Charles. Uh, it's called First Meeting. And the events of this poem, alas, there's no LSD in it, only movies, but uh, the, the poem takes place five years earlier. So 1991. Um, First meeting. I rushed up to the line of a sold out movie. You, in front of me, told me it was sold out. As I pondered a way to sneak in, I saw something in your face I knew I would meet one day. Yet I kept talking, unafraid. I was not looking for love. I was always looking for love. Only our voices held each other that night. After seeing a different movie, Writing the 22 from Japantown to the mission, we did not exchange numbers. Um, true story. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a poem. Uh, let's see. I'm going to read one of, one of my poems from the anthology. Let me I have it up here. Oh, why is it so big? Okay. Uh, why did it do that? Um, there we go, okay. So this poem is called To Breathe. Thank you to the wind for bringing us fresh air and taking our brother on his journey. Michelle and Ashley Monterosa at the remembrance protest for Sean Monterosa, murdered by a Vallejo police officer as he was demonstrating for Black Lives, June 5th, 2020. Wind, fresh air, to breathe, to take oxygen into lungs so it can travel through veins, like our ancestor, the fish who ambled onto land. Air in lungs, our animal inheritance. Where does my body begin? Where does it end? Molecules enter and leave me dispersing into air. I breathe you, you breathe me. We stand six feet apart, cover faces, sanitize surfaces, stay home, all to protect this right to breathe. Then what of George Floyd? He survives his birth. Black boyhood, black adolescence, young black manhood. He even survives the virus and keeps breathing, keeps breathing. If we hold our breath long enough, we will go unconscious and our bodies will begin to breathe again. To calm the chaos inside, spiritual teachers tell us, focus on the breath, 
this miracle of air entering and leaving our lungs. Watch it, hear it, feel it. Offer gratitude to this air, this friend that accompanies us in and out of our bodies on this terrestrial journey. George Floyd survives the virus. We stay home so he can recover. And yet, recovered lungs cannot help him when a murderer in police uniform crushes his throat. Son of a mother who pushed him from water to air and wept at his first crying breath, he cries for her after his last breath is spent. Tell us, whose breath are we protecting now? How will we heal ourselves from this deadlier virus that takes away the air in our lungs? Thank you so much, Tamina. I love the way you read too, you're so powerful. And you sent a lot of uh, your students uh, um, submitted uh, work uh, to, the, to the book. So I appreciate that as well. Um, let's see, An Bui. Yay, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too, Shizai and everyone. This poem is called Shelter in Place. On March 17th, 2020, Santa Clara County issued a shelter in place mandate. I've been staying home ever since and even before, temporarily employed since May, flirting with unemployment since March and grieving in San Jose since November. From a social distance, the world feels quiet but isn't silent. Hums of an airplane fly through hazy orange skies as California forests crackle through acres and acres, begging for indigenous stewardship and care, questioning why we don't for her and the incarcerated who soothe her birth. Inside, screen lights stay on long before and after dark. News outlets and media continue to tell us to slow the spread. But they only mean of the virus, not of police brutality and racism across the states, not of the evictions of those losing their home sweet homes, not of the transfers to ICE detention centers and deportations, nor of hidden agendas of politicians that put profit over people or the amount of work and labor you must still produce. Even during a global pandemic, when the world is burning, people are dying and places are closing, society makes sure to tell us that we're not worthy of care. But this is a lie. And in our multi-generational homes in San Jose, we have no choice but to take care of each other. For we know what it's like to live in chaos and survive. Refugee resilience alive and flowing through our ancestry. COVID-19 could never ban this essential love this healing of our past through Gochu at Hoi Su, this building of our future in solidarity with our Gong No. We must learn to mend the gaps between Thien Viet, Espanol, and English. We can't keep this distance of six feet apart from other communities, can't preach what we won't even try to practice in our own homes and city, because liberation cannot exist just in theory. The world is on fire. We can't pretend that we don't see the smoke. Our loved ones have passed into ancestors and they can never come back. So we don't have to wait for the county to lift restrictions for us to connect because we are all that we have left. And this cannot be all that we leave for those after us. Thank you. So great to see you read that uh, uh, on, I, I enjoy it on the page, but you just bring so much to the reading. It's, it's really great to see you read it. Uh, so next is um, Andre Lamont Wilson. Uh, thank you, uh, Shezaway, and thank you everyone who contributed uh, to this uh, anthology. Phantom Man. On St. Patrick's Day, I plan to wear my Kiss Me, I'm 6.25% Irish t-shirt. 
But the executive director closed our Oakland Day Program for Adults with Disabilities on March 16, 2020, because of the pandemic. Now my shirt remained unworn in my closet while I remained at home, navigating the unfamiliar world thrust upon me and billions. I had worked as a backup personal care attendant for 25 years. I changed the diapers and clothes of men who couldn't change them themselves. In the absence of lifting men from the wheelchair to the toilet and back five days a week, my body experienced shock. I had adapted my body to support another man's body to such an extent that I felt lost without him like the hindquarters of a centaur separated from its man half. I wobbled on two hooves. A severed horse torso searched for its man half, but couldn't find him. Memories of his weight lingered in my flanks. He existed only as a phantom limb, a phantom man. If man and horse were united again, the virus could kill us. I had engaged in work I couldn't do remotely. Social distancing and six feet were incompatible with a job that required close physical contact with the bodies of others. I watched with trepidation as first dozens, then hundreds, and then thousands of attendants and nurses in nursing homes, group homes, and hospitals contracted the virus and died. I wonder if I would receive personal protective equipment when I returned to work, or if I would be forced to wear a trash bag. I returned to work on April Fool's Day. The building was empty of the sounds of wheelchairs, walkers, and their occupants. A skeleton crew of masked staff either taught Zoom classes or disinfected surfaces. The executive director asked if I wanted to teach storytelling. I used to perform stories before participants behind the building after lunch. But in the year before the pandemic, attendants needed my help in the restroom after every lunch. All storytelling ceased. I told my director I would think about it over the weekend. On Monday, I told her yes. During the shutdown, I had attended several literary events and workshops on Zoom. So I was familiar with the virtual meeting technology. However, I was so accustomed to working behind the scene, wiping behinds, that I felt odd working in front of a camera. I used to change men. Now the pandemic changed me. My first Zoom storytelling classes consisted of videos of my storytelling performances, comedians with uh, disabilities, followed by class discussion. However, my host so botched the sharing of videos that I took over as host and began to tell stories. Why are you still wearing that? A participant asked from his box on the screen. His eyes motioned to the mask and shield on my face. I said, I wear them not because of you, but because of the support staff around me. For the next class, I placed a portable dry erase board behind me, not only to block views of the classroom, but to prevent staff from walking up and breathing near me, even if they were wearing masks. Now, I removed my ghost bedsheet, shield and mask, and unleashed the full arsenal of facial expressions and gestures during storytelling. The participants laughed from their screen boxes, like the Brady Bunch in their tic-tac-toe boxes at the beginning of their 70s show. After six weeks, I received a report. My storytelling class had the highest average attendance of any class we offered on Wednesday. I filled my office with storytelling books and ordered another on virtual storytelling. 
I intend to revamp my lesson plan to make my class more interactive. I'm not in a rush to reattach my horse half to my man half as his essential servant after the pandemic. I have a lot of stories to tell. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, I also should say um, here, I should say that Andre and um, and uh, Kevin uh, Madrigal and uh, Tamina and um, uh, Chris Perkins were all part of the ed editorial committee. Uh, and there are some others too. I I, I I don't know if you're here tonight, but um, uh, they put a lot of time and energy into reading the submissions. I was expecting, you know, maybe to get submissions from 40, pe 40 people, and instead I got, you know. 140, 150 submissions. A lot of people submitted more than one piece. So it was a lot of reading. And um, Andre read every single piece and commented on all of them. And he has a full-time job, <laughs> um, you know, working with, uh, with people with disabilities. So, and, you know, Tamina teaches and, you know, um, uh, Chris is also a high school teacher. Uh, I, I mean, it's, I, I, you know, and I didn't really realize this at the time when I first started right now, five years ago, I wanted to give a uh, voice to um, writers and artists of color, but gradually I began to see a lot of folks, they're not writers sitting in some garret somewhere in isolation, um, you know, I would say the vast majority of people that submit to right now and come to right now are doing um, things already that make a difference in society. And maybe they're not necessarily the decision makers, uh, um, but they are a lot of times in the front line, you know, working working with uh, with students and kids and uh, the elderly and um, you know doing social work and and all kinds of of things, um, you know, it's, this is, and I think that, you know, the literature of, you know, precious people writing in garrets, living off their trust funds, um, you know, that, that, that era is, is fading away. And um, we are what's replacing it. This, you know, what we write about is real life about real people. Um, and the, lessons that come from that, you know, fiction is fine, but um, you can make up ha happy endings in your head, sitting in your garret and not engaging with real people. And those, those things that are written are not going to be the same truth as if you're out in the street engaging with people. Um, there's so much richness if you allow yourself to engage, if you allow yourself to, I uh, think, how can I make a difference, um, even if it's a small one? You know, how do I deal with disappointment and stress and ad adversity? Those are the things that enrich our writing. Um, so that's part of my plug. I think I'll, I'll go on here a little bit. I have two writing workshops every month. One of them is at the main library. Um, they're both virtual. And uh, second Tuesdays, at, from six till eight, um, sign up through the main library. That's called the Hatchery. Let's see, the Hatchery um, Creative Writing for Writers of Color. And then on Eventbrite, you can look and find um, Right Now um, SF Bay um, Third Saturdays. And um, uh, that's, that's another workshop. Uh, the library one is free and the other one is, uh, you know, one to $10. Um, and, you know, if you don't wanna spend the dollar then you don't have to do that. But I have spent a lot of money in my time taking writing workshops that were, yeah, useful in a lot of ways um, from different organizations around the city uh, and Oftentimes I was like the only 
writer of color. Um, maybe there were one or two others. A lot of times they were very quiet. Sometimes they dropped out after the first or second week. So that's one of the reasons that I started right now. I want to hang out with other writers of color. Uh, I want to, you know, talk about real life. I want to be real. I don't want to be pretentious and literary, you know. Uh, so anyway, if you're interested and if you are, if you're not a person of color, please support us anyway and sign up for our our um, mailing list and come to our readings. If you are a person of color, then uh, let let us know that and and ask to ask um, to um, to get on the uh, the mailing list for our workshops. Um, I think that over the last five years, um, I have interacted with over 300 people. They've either come to the workshops or they've been published in the books. And it's like this amazing community. And, uh, you know, a lot of you are too busy to come to the workshops. I wish you could come because <laughs> it's always such a joy to see you. But, um, you know, we have this sort of movable feast of, of people and you never know who's going to show up, you know. Um, uh, so that's one of the joys of it. And, and it's it's not just seasoned writers and established writers. There's a lot of people who've never written before. They're just thinking about writing, et cetera, et cetera. And you're more than welcome. I'm a college dropout myself. I sort of taught myself how to do what I do, and I don't know how well I do it. So, uh, you know, I certainly am not in a position to judge anybody. And I think that's one of the things about the whole literary educational establishment is the way they shame people into doubting their own thinking and their own words. So um, yeah, so uh, put your email address in the uh, the chat if you want to be on our mailing list. Um, so uh, <laughs> sorry to make you wait, Crystal, but there it is. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so next is Crystal Rica Perkins, and she comes to write now regularly as she is writing a really interesting book. <laughs> Hi, All right. everyone. Thank you so much, Jose, and everyone who's been involved. Thank you so much. Um, um, I just feel so welcome. I've been up in the Bay Area for five, six years, and I came up here to join the literary community. So here I am. Uh, I have two epistolary poems. The first one is called From One Teacher to Another. Dear Rona, I'm going to teach exponential relationships this week. You are the prime example of how curves go upward, neatly tabled evidence ample we graph the cases doubling and the number of deaths per day troubling as we make tables and model the flattening that we seek, the peak, the elusive peak. But then again, it's hard to preach the importance of algebra two when a mom calls at 2.32 Saturday of week two. Sorry to be rude. Yes, we got the laptop and the hotspot too. But what we need is food. Dear Rona, I'm going to teach about supply and demand curves, widgets and guns versus butter this week. You are the prime example. The supply of hospital beds, ventilators, protective gear, the demand of the people for life work to get back to the pursuit of happiness. We'll play the stock market game. But then again, it's a luxury to lecture economic theory when a student texts from a neighbor's cell phone, teacher, I can't talk unless you call me because our phone is cut off. We just moved and then my mom and dad were laid off. Dear Rona, I'm going to teach about the food chain. The biology textbook says that humans are on top, but you are teaching me otherwise. Thank you. The second poem, also an epistolary poem that I have is called From One Virus to Another. Dear COVID-19, 
You are 10K smaller than a human cell. You target our heart, lungs, kidneys, and intestines, invade, hijacking the cell structure to replicate so that from the one comes the two, comes the four, comes the multitude, so many more, to overwhelm your house, your host. You are killing individuals, institutions. We humans strive to create antibodies against you. Dear COVID-19, all humans put together are 10K to the 10 power, the size of the earth. We target the water, the atmosphere, the mountains and the valleys, colonizing and hijacking the planet's resources, becoming super predators, classes, consumerism, hyper inequalities, the haves and haves not revolt. With each revolution, we become stronger, more prolific at murder and mayhem. We are killing entire species and forests, overwhelming our hosts. Dear COVID-19, I think perhaps you are the Earth's antibody. Now mother nature pits us against each other, virus against virus. It's not personal, I know. All viruses are immoral whether we want to admit it or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Um, I have a couple of more shout outs to make. Um, I hear that Rosalie Cavallaro is in the audience and uh, she has proofread all of the anthologies and she did it again this time, even though she has a full-time job uh, working in affordable housing. Um, and we had a crazy schedule this year, but Rosalie hung in there uh, with us and, and did all the proofreading. And Azel um, T, I, I, I don't think you heard me say earlier, uh, but you contributed a lot to this cover. Um, you're the one who suggested the sans serif yellow type on the black background, which I think really makes the image um, that much more striking. So thank you very much for um, leaping to the occasion and donating your design talents when Kevin said, hmm, I think the book could use a little tweaking, the cover could use a little tweaking. So uh, thank you for that. And I think that, um, God, I'm blanking out, uh, Clarion Alley um, Mural Project, I'm blanking out on your first name right now. <laughs> but I think, you, I, I think I saw your name in the audience as well. And I want to thank you for your work on the Clarion um, Alley Mural Project and for um, uh, giving the opportunity to the artists, the Japanese artists from Osaka who um, did the mural that this is a detail of. Um, the booksellers have been going nuts over, over the cover. And, um, and I think it's really powerful. And I love the fact that there are a couple of Japanese guys from Osaka that do commercial art uh, as their day job. Uh, but they they uh, they like to do murals as well, and um, their work is just incredibly um, powerful. And the photographer for this, uh, there were actually two. I first learned about this from one of the writers, uh, Kalechi Ubozo, and then um, uh, the photographer who photographed this particular version is Edzo Rivera, who is New Yorkian, and he loves uh, street murals. And he used to be my neighborhood uh, mailman. And I used to just love to see him. He'd walk around the neighborhood with a big smile and a pith helmet. And, uh, uh, you know, over the, over the years, I, I learned, you know, that he has, he um, has a collection of 7,000 street art photos and, uh, and um, loves to travel. So you never know who you're going to find talking to people on the street. They're just amazing, amazing people. Um, so uh, anyway, next up, we're going to have um, three artists. Um, they're going to put up their work. Um, uh, I, I, I included, I'm a visual artist myself, so I like to include some art in the book. And 
Um, all of the, there's a hundred um, color images in the book. Um, so um, anyway, the artists will be um, in this order, Cindy Shi, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, Lorraine Bonner and Mark Harris. Thank you so much, Isaway. Can you all hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, unfortunately, I don't have slides for um, the images I have, but they're in the book. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Isaway, for all your hard work birthing this book into existence I'm, and creating this platform for really underrepresented artists and voices to tell their stories. Um, uh, in this book, so I have four pieces in this book. Um, they're titled Seasons, uh, Seven Plum Blossoms for Jacob Blake, Cultural Decay, and The Case for Hope. And all these pieces have a short caption in, that describes my inspiration. So I'm not gonna read it, but you can go ahead and take a look when you get a chance. Um, but um, but I really, you know, all these, all the, all the pieces that I have included also utilize the fresco inspired technique using layers of burnished Venetian plaster and um, on panel mixed with Sumi ink, um, Chinese watercolor and various pigments. Um, the process is a very slow and deliberate and kind of informs a narrative like our political and social landscape. Um, and it, it kind of a it sort of uh, kind of cracks and it does its own thing. So it, it sort of changes the uh, landscape in which I, I think is kind of a good metaphor for individual stories uh, of immigrants in this country. And then the stories are kind of within the fissures and in the cracks. Um, and my choice of materials are actually emphasizing the interconnectedness of human migration, the sharing of ideas. Um, and, you know, despite what the borders, what, what the current administration wants our borders to look like, you know, what they want us to define us as, and what the political landscape is at the present, it provides a quiet and passionate reflection of, um, of the discussions around race and society and environmental justice. Uh, my work often uses a lot of cyclones and, and forces of nature and, um, and symbols around that. Um, and so they really kind of um, suggest the, the societal forces that pull immigrants into a place and push them out um, after they've, you know, utilize their labor. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a state of always being on the inside and outside in temporary states and endless alternation. Um, and, and I just want to end on um, the fact that there's there's no accident that, that I think the Bay Area continues to be such a creative powerhouse for artists of color that continue on to success elsewhere or wherever. Um, it's such a dynamic and fertile ground paved by activists um, to allow for new voices to shine. And um, having grow, grown up in a place where that doesn't exist, um, I, re I really understand and recognize um, the immense effort that it takes to build and nurture that community. And I'm just really proud to be a part of the book that really exemplifies that effort. So thank you again, Shiz um, and the editorial team and all of you for the thankless work that makes wh where we live so special. Um, and, and it's really all because of you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I guess you didn't get the email that, um, uh, uh, what I asked the artists to do is to put together PowerPoints of their images. Um, uh, so Sorry, yeah. that didn't happen. And I'm, um, and I unfortunately am not, I'm on my laptop right now and not on my main screen. Uh, so I couldn't, I couldn't jump <laughs> on and, and, um, show the image. Okay, there's one image. So, no, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, you know, I must have missed an email because I really didn't have that prepared. Well, and... I mean, you are kind of busy right now <laughs> um, creating a baby and you just had a residency at the, um, at the Van Gogh exhibit. So it's not as if you're sitting around the house twiddling your thumbs. Ah, okay. I'm just, I'm wow. Getting, Fabulous. Getting, Thank I'm you. You did that. Just, this is me. I'm giving everyone oh. just a preview. If you want to see the rest of this season, <laughs> you have to get the book. Thank yeah. you so much, oh, Kevin. That's thank awesome. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, she has four pieces in, in the book and they all sort of blend that sort of uh, Chinese uh, brush painting sensitive sensibility with, uh, with, with her, um, her social conscience. Um, 
So, okay. So next is um, what, uh, Lorraine Bonner, who is a poet as well as a sculptor. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Shusui and the jurors uh, for, um, uh, for selecting my work to be in this fabulous, beautiful anthology. And I want to thank the library um, for hosting us. And um, I have a couple of pieces of, uh, of writing and art in this book, and I'm just gonna try and share this one. Uh, see if I can go to full screen here. Slideshow, there we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, okay. This piece is, this is piece, this piece represents where we are now. Oh God, it's slideshowing all by itself. It shouldn't be doing that. I'm gonna try and go back there. Okay, I'd like to stay there, just stay there. Okay, this piece is called Blinded by White. Uh, and when I say white, I don't mean so-called white, so-called race, because I defy you to find anybody with skin the color of paper. Um, and we all know there's no such thing as race. When I say white, I mean the perpetrator. And when I say perpetrator, I don't mean the guy being perp walked by the cop to the cop car on the cop show. When I say perpetrator, I mean something specific. I mean someone who violates a trust. Because we as human beings survived and evolved as uh, for millions of years because of trust and trustworthiness. It's the foundation of human society. And this person, this sculpture is representative of all of us. Uh, what I call multi-hued humanity many different shades of brown from very, very dark to very, very pale, tinges of red and yellow. And yes, even so-called white people, you have, or maybe you're very pale brown, you may be a little rosy, maybe a little bit of yellow, but you have melanin, you know, just deal with it. So this human person has a bird in her chest, which, ah, there it is, okay, good, worked. Um, uh, a blackbird in a white cage. And you probably remember the poet Maya Angelou who wrote the book and the poem, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She sings because she has a song. This is the natural state of the human being, a human singing. Now, because we have layers and layers of genes and brain cells devoted to this complicated thing called social living, which is based on trust and the expectation of trustworthiness. When someone has betrayed your trust, when they perpetrated against you, that is trauma. And when you're traumatized, scientists have discovered and they have brain scans to, show, to prove it, that it messes your mind up. And as we all know, we see with our minds and not with our eyes. In other words, as folks in the South used to say, and probably still do, when confronted with an act of perpetration, you don't know whether to go to the bathroom in your underwear or go blind. There's a shorter version, but this is a library, so I'm not gonna say it. So for those of us raised in this traumatic environment, being taught that there is such a thing as a superior center of the universe race, the norm against which everything else is inferior, which is the most beautiful and kind and intelligent race, the most highly evolved race. We know there's no such thing as race. And did I mention it as a white race? And that everything white is good and pure and holy and true. Well, this is the kind of perpetration against the truth that is extremely traumatizing. And that can make it difficult, very difficult to see properly regardless of where along the spectrum of melanin, your skin color happens to fall. So as long as we are blinded by this trauma, I'm gonna try and go back here. The blackbird of our heart has to stay in her cage 
And although she has a song, it may be difficult to hear as well. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Lenore. Lorraine. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I did it again. I called you Lenore instead of Lorraine. Yes, and yes. I think one reason is because I was thinking that I a few more uh, thanks I need to give is um, I think one of the reasons for this fantastic turnout tonight um, is um, Lenore Naxon of Naxon Consulting and John Fink of um, Encore Communications 2.0. They are white allies who really walk the walk. Um, they, um, I, you know, I paid them a pittance of, you know, what they normally charge to do what they do, but they have 25, 30 years of experience in, um, in publicity and, and um, you know, they, they know how to reach people and they're persistent about it. So I really appreciate that. Um, and um, I also wanna thank the San Francisco Arts Commission and um, California Humanities and the Literary um, uh, Emergency Fund um, for uh, helping um, put this together. I think that this would not have turned into an unwieldy, uh, overly ambitious pro uh, project if I hadn't gotten a little bit of funding <laughs> to help me along. Um, anyway, so, uh, and then the, uh, the last of the artists, but not the least is um, uh, Mark Harris. Thank you, um, Shiz, and thank you, uh everyone who is is joining and has hung out um, to hear a uh, hear me talk a little bit about my work um, I think this is the third time I've been included in one of in one of the anthologies that she has put together and I um, I just have to say that uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, having an outlet for work that isn't always easy and accessible for people to digest, um, but that I believe is necessary to really sort of shaking us um, out of our out of our sleep and spurring us to action. Um, and so the the pieces that I have uh, that were chosen for the book are some older works from 2015, and um, you know they're they're pretty visceral pieces that were uh, cathartic for me that dealt with um, just some specific incidences uh, regarding racial violence and just um, processing my emotions as, as African-American um, in this country. So the first piece here is called Pride and Prejudice. And um, I, all my work, the work that's included in this uh, anthology is all mixed media collage. So I use a lot of historical imagery that I will sometimes juxtapose with current imagery. Uh, imagery. And I'm trying to create an alternative narrative to um, just the experience, you know, what some people may see when they look at something and flip it on its head to really get them to asking questions of themselves about how, how they fit into to what, what's happening. Um, so this first piece was in response to the Charleston massacre um, in 2015, and um, it's it's it pretty much uh, just was a, a snapshot of my emotions at the time when I remember hearing about the incident as it happened. Um, I immediately went to my studio and just ideas uh, started, you know, coming in, and this is a result um, of that particular incident. Um, the next piece I'm gonna to go to is, uh, it's a little bit lighter. Um, it's called In Guns We Trust. Uh, and I created this piece again, looking at the symbol of the Statue of Liberty, something that everyone knows throughout the world and brings their own interpretations to and, and making a little bit more tongue in cheek, but very serious in addressing the amount of gun violence um, that we have in this country. Um, that affects people of all races and, um, you know, really sort of taking a shot at our, our Christian values. Um, and instead of in God we trust, I, I went within guns we trust. Um, again, this is, these are old 
this image of the woman is from an old uh, maiden form bra ad from the uh, late 60s. And I added some other elements to it to, again, try to sort of create that, that wrinkle. Um, next piece, uh, another pretty heavy piece for me. But again, these pieces for me were cathartic, things that I needed to do to, to, to stay sane. <laughs> um, as, uh, you know, there was so much um, police, you know, state-sponsored violence against African-American men and boys. Um, you know, all throughout the history of this country, but really ramping up in, in, in 2014 with the death of Michael Brown. Um, and this is a piece again, that was just reflecting um, my feelings um, and, and uh, sort of the indifference that I see regarding, uh, again, violence, state-sponsored violence from our police taxpayer-funded agency against African-Americans. And the last piece, um, this is a more recent piece that I created um, last year, last summer. And this piece was inspired um, after the um, grand jury hearings in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, it was the day that the uh, David Cameron, or I can't remember the guy's name, whoever the AG is in Kentucky, um, an African-American man came out and basically said that there would be no charges brought against the murderers of Breonna Taylor. So this piece, I, um, I used a real mirror. Um, if you see it in person, you would see your own reflection in this piece. And I used the actual um, uh, police patch uh, from Louisville PD and the badge. Uh, and again, just just really a summation of what I was feeling on that day um, when that announcement was made, just the, the, the real disgust that I had. Um, so that's that's uh, that's it. That's a sort of a, a uh, overview of the work that I was um, fortunate enough to to have in in the anthology. So again, Shiz, thank you so much um, for creating a platform for people to share, um, share their work about their experiences and hopefully create um, conversation and inspire people to action no matter how small. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, I just love your work. Um, uh, okay, uh, so in the second set of readers, we're going to have Dena Rod, Francie Covington, uh, Karina Muniz Pagan, Kevin Madrigal Galindo, Lena Bagonia, Max Leon, Venus the Zathura Noble, and Yeva Johnson. Okay, so Dena. Hi there. I'm excited to read some new poems for you tonight. This first one is called Case Number 0812001. I ended up writing case, uh, missing case reports for things that we were missing during the lockdown and quarantine. Missing foresight. We ignored the harbingers of spring. Rushed omens warned off our shoulders as we carried on despite corpses trailing our steps. The coming specter of a dripping mandarin crushed in his hands as he smiled gleefully, vituberating everyone in sight. We have no video game power-ups to fight the big boss, only the veil of reality crashing down on our heads. Case number 0812002. Missing. Trajectory. No one knows where we're going anymore, least of all the future. Five-year plans crumble into getting through the next 24 hours, each hour sifting through our hands like powdered sugar on top of freshly fried dough, oil absorbing each fleck into a thick paste. We stop and start rusted joints waiting for oil that will never come. 
standing still. We claim someone glued our eyelids shut, but we can clearly see the whites of our eyes bald with fear over what the next four years will bring. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dena. I know you've been really busy lately with Pride Week and all, so I really appreciate that you made the time to come. Uh, let's see, um, Francie Covington. Francie, you're muted. You're still muted. Hmm. Mm. Francie, why don't you go out and come back in and we'll go to the next person. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, Karina? Yes, thank you all so much. Um, really hey. grateful to be here. Um, my piece is called Offering. As an organizer for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, I had the privilege of being able to work from home, but the house cleaners, nannies, and care workers in our membership did not. By April 2020, most domestic workers had lost 85 to 90 percent of their jobs. The caregivers who were still working risked their lives to take care of others while lacking access to hazard pay or enough PPE to keep them safe. I was witnessing the race and class divide in heartbreakingly sharp contrast. So many black and brown women I knew were the ones doing the essential work and bearing the brunt of the virus. During this time, I received an invite from a theater friend to participate in a virtual festival where teams of three, one writer, dancer, and musician, all strangers, would come together online for one day. Fiona began the festival as a response to the impact COVID had on artists worldwide to show how creativity could transcend borders and isolation. So along with 30 other artists from 11 different countries, our group of three had one day to create a piece based on one of the four elements before the virtual curtain went up to debut our five minute video. The theme my group chose was earth. So I sank my feet into the earth, looked up the, at the sky in my own silent early morning ceremony, and then sat down to write this offering. Madre Tierra, Donancin, Pachamama, Mother Earth. In the silence of your branches, we hear your words, as I, my love, shall mourn for thee. Donancin, Mother Earth, let the absence of touch be retrieved in the warmth of your soil. Dig our hands in so deep, the alchemy of your womb turns fingers into roots grounded amidst this insanity of grief. Hold our fragility for what we thought couldn't break from the weight of invisible war. You are the original life cycle, the reminder of only two constants, a composting graveyard, a seedbed of growth, of hunger that waits to be fed by tomorrow's sun. Madre Tierra, Donancin, Mother Earth, root us to you to this calm underneath the storm, the glimmer of dew on a silent still morning, life buzzing just below the surface. You are the expansiveness of our contained constricted bodies of rhythms we took for granted, the magic of a hummingbird's migration, the freedom of movement, the interconnectedness of all life forms. Madre Tierra, Donancin, Pachamama, Mother Earth, in the silence of your branches, we hear your words, as I, my love, shall mourn for thee. We touch your soil in honor of the bodies we could not hold nor properly prepare, could not kiss goodbye nor touch our lips to outstretched hands, caress a forehead, whisper prayers of peace in unexpected last breaths. Our tears they cannot see. Madre Tierra, Tonancin, we lay marigolds at your feet. Underneath your swaying branches, crack open our hearts 
to this collective grief. The roots of inequity exposed, cavernous wounds, safety nets washed away in the river's surge. This was not of your making. So much sorrow could have been prevented. And still we are here, letting go of perceived control, accepting the offering of your stillness. Left with our essence, plant our feet firmly inside your resilient core. May we move with the lightness of spring's renewal. Thank you all. I can see everyone now, so. <laughs> okay, Francie. Do you want to try? Yes, I'll try now. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay, we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see anybody. I mean, technology is my nemesis. So uh, here I go. Uh, the name of this piece is Uneasy Lies the Head of the Black Mom. I listen in the night for the return of my son, who is out with his friends for the evening. I don't worry about his non-Black friends. They're congenial, working hard at their first jobs post-college, just as he is. I worry about those who do not know my son, who've never had a conversation with him. I worry that his insistence on his right not to be hassled, arrested, or beaten by police without cause will be seen in and of itself as an act of aggression. I fear any interaction he might have with police officers who lean more toward the warrior code than their public service mandate. As the daughter of a black man, the widow of a black man, and the mother of a black man. I have lived in a state of heightened anxiety about the safety of the men in my life for my entire life. I've had to teach my son that whenever he goes into a store, even if it's raining outside, he must remove his hoodie slide his hoodie off his head and leave it off until he leaves the premises. He has to take his hand out of his pocket while waiting to, for the cashier to ring him up. He must put his purchases in a bag, not walk out of the store with them in his hand. And always, always, get a receipt and do not discard it until he is home. I tell him that people are so blinded by suspicion of all black males over the age of five that they can't tell the robber from the frat guy, they, the shopkeeper from the man who doesn't want you know, to carry his groceries around who doesn't want to carry his bottle of water around because he plans to drink it as soon as he leaves the store. But somebody might accuse him of being a thief. I remind him that he has to think not only for himself, but the people who will assume he's a criminal or just up to no good because that's what they've been told. You'll be considered dangerous until you're well into your seventies. About the police, I say, make sure your phone is on and fully charged before you leave the house. If you see the flashing lights of a police vehicle behind you, activate your phone, 
pull over and place your hands on the steering wheel. If you're a passenger in the car, at all times, keep your empty hands where the police can see them. Again, make sure your phone is recording. He says, ah, oh, mom, you worry too much. I think, I hope I haven't left anything out. There is such a thing as beautiful, loving sons like mine, just as there are such things as tasers, lethal weapons, centuries old assumptions and racism. Racism handed down casually and yes, sometimes intentionally by millions of other moms and dads. I know that after he's received a great graduate degree, married and had children of his own, even then I will worry because his blackness will not have faded. When the downstairs door finally opens and the hushed steps of his room received, of his footsteps recede down the hallway, I take my first deep breath of the night, relieved that at least tonight, my son's name will not be preceded by a hashtag. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francie. Mm -hmm. um, next is um, Kevin Madrigal Galinda. Mm -hmm. Well, hello. I just want to say thank you, Francie, for that reading. Oh, <laughs> that you. was really incredible. Thank um, you. Cool. I am going to share one piece that is an anthology and then maybe something else. Um, it's a very short one. This piece is called, Not All Heroes Wear Capes, But They Do Wear Masks. At least Rosavia does, for her protection and for yours. She's 73 and not a goddamn pandemic is gonna stop her from distributing food to her community in need. She makes sure each car that pulls up to the emergency food relief pantry is loaded before they're off on their way. A beaming smile on her face, her mouth covered, but I can see it in her grin wrinkled eyes. At 73, she's a hero. Not a goddamn pandemic is gonna stop her. Uh, Rosavia, all the folks that made just like those acts of humanity during the pandemic possible. Um, the other piece that's included in the anthology of, uh, that, that I submitted, I like can't, I, I cannot read without crying. So I am not going to make myself cry tonight because I don't feel like crying tonight. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel like crying, but not tonight. Um, uh, so I'm gonna read uh, a new piece uh yeah just about like a friend a friend of mine recently said uh being who we are is a very powerful the most powerful act of survival and i think it's very true accepting all parts of ourselves and and unapologetically being them so this is self-portrait as list self-portrait as recipe self-portrait as disobedient poodle mutt self-portrait as boy in his abuela's wedding dress self-portrait as are you sure he's not gay? Self-portrait as Corrido. Self-portrait as Raphael, the dual-wielding ninja turtle. Self-portrait as sex addict. Self-portrait as El Fajo, coming to whoop my ass. Self-portrait as the pair of shoes stolen through broken glass. Self-portrait as Kevin, the kid from Home Alone. Self-portrait as Huevos Rancheros. Self-portrait as alternative R&B. Self-portrait as cognitive behavioral therapy. Self-portrait as three freshly picked squash blossoms, now dead. Self-portrait as queer, 
self-portrait as dry hopped beer, self-portrait as anxiety and fear, self-portrait as non-stick frying pan, self-portrait as faded 2003 Corolla with roll-up windows, self-portrait as SpongeBob edition Kraft mac and cheese, Self-portrait as, Tina, you fat lard, come get some dinner. Self-portrait as, man in a woman's blouse. Self-portrait as, Maquil Kots Kakwatli, the god of gluttony. Self-portrait as, identity crisis. Self-portrait as, nopal that grew from concrete, waiting to be held, to be seen, afraid of being alone, these spines only temporary, and the fruit is on its way. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's see, uh, next is uh, Lena Vagonia. Hello, everyone. I have two poems to share, both written at different points in my life, which will make this very exciting. Um, the first is in dedication to the eldest daughters of immigrant mothers. And that is what this, this is a very deeply important poem to share and write. I'm very honored that it's in part of this anthology. Yes, I'm thanking you, Mother Bird, for all the overripe persimmons purple orchids, dusty bundles of kale washed carefully by hands that serve garden cats, your kindest captors. You are my green thumb, batis, sweet and sour sauce, bean sprout, lumpia, no pork, the way Papa likes it. The voice in my head telling me to make my bed, wipe down the counters, scrub the grime, don't become your father. If I scrub hard enough, do I become an altar? Cleanliness is next to godliness or clamp shut. Like mother, like child, I was never your daughter. Searching for you everywhere, succulents, ginger, Ceylon tea, scarlet red tomatoes that'll never be as sweet as the ones you grew and broke soil. Backs, blistering skin, all those summers searching for you and people. Ravenous mouthfuls of skin, tissue, and fragments of a lover, all bones. Mouthfuls of affirmations, lungs of smoke, all the blueberries in the world in lieu of a love I would never receive. How would you know? You were never given the chance to taste honey, figs, gulai, seafood pasta, opposed to thorny mouthfuls, applicant rejections, greedy fingers, foul mouthed daughters, worms in my teeth, disjointed sentences, death by a stubborn God. What was the last thing you said to your mother before you never saw her again? I never asked. We fought too much, gnawing at my tongue, cheek, drawing pools of blood. There are cops at the door. When did I learn to be afraid? Did he ever touch you anywhere? Mother's averting eyes tell all, like mother, like child, she swallows her tongue in shame. The weight rests upon buckling knees and weary shoulders. Pacific has cleansed me of all the muck and grime. Am I holy enough for you now that I've drenched myself in salt water? That whiskey and belly, curry steams on top of a bed of rice, morning throw up, dirty teeth, burning up my fingertips when I get too close to the flame. I smoke through every phone call. The blunt is next. The white noise is paralyzing. Mama's disappointed chatter in my brain passed down like a mother bird trying to feed her baby, but they choke instead. <sighs> Uh, the last one is quite short and one of my favorite poems writing in college. It's called Mestiza. Mestiza, noun, of Latin American origin, also used in the Philippines to note a woman of mixed race, commonly refers in the context of the Philippines to a mixed Filipina woman. Anytime a white woman looks at me, she does not paint me mestiza. She categorizes me as ambiguity, the bridging of two cultures, two lands, two people who never committed in the first place. She allows me to take her purse, not without removing her wallet, laughing as she says, just in case. She does not see me as mestiza or grant me the keys of whiteness. She leads me to the gate and slams the door in my face. Thank you all.
Thank you, Lena. Um, yeah, I had done, uh, I never met Lena. She, she submitted her work and it was such a wonderful surprise. So I'm uh, glad to, to see you on screen and um, hope to see you at some of the workshops sometime. Uh, I think you have conflicts on, you work on the days that we have some workshops, unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, uh, so um, let's see. Uh, next is uh, Max Leong. And um, Max has about nine haiku in the book, but I had scheduled, he had, see, he had said he didn't want to read, so I sort of, uh, booked everybody in, and then he changed his mind. So uh, he only has time to read one, unfortunately. But Max, maybe you could read it a couple of times so we can savor it. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, She's Wei. Thank you, everyone, for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, this haiku I wrote in late March of 2020 um, in the middle of well, at the very beginning of the, the lockdown and when the, a lot of the attacks against Asians um, started happening in, in 2020. And so I wrote this in my room <laughs> at, you know, when everything was in the red tier, completely locked down and we were all just holed up in our apartments. And I looked out my, my window and in front of my house on my block are cherry blossom trees. And of course, you know, if anybody knows about cherry blossoms, they all bloom um, at the same time every year in San Francisco in um, around late March, early April. So yeah, so it, we're in the middle, in the beginning stages of lockdown, you know, anti-Asian attacks. I'm sitting in my apartment for, you know, for the past couple of weeks, I look out my window, and I see that the street is covered in pink and I was just admiring the, the beauty, you know, of, despite, you know, the times that we were in. Um, so my poem goes like this. Cherry blossoms bloom amidst season of the witch. Pink is beautiful. And the season of the witch line, uh, has so many layers to me and so much meaning, not only because we were in lockdown in the middle of a pandemic and not only because um, of the rise in anti-Asian attacks, not only because we were, you know, with, you know, the previous administration, you know, uh, but um, also, it also pays tribute to David Talbot's book, Season of the Witch, as well, who is another San Francisco um, author, author. So there's many layers of that to me. Um, so yeah, that's my poem and the different layers and, and the, the meaning behind it. And thank you all so very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here amongst giants. Bless. And maybe some other reading, uh, Max, we can uh, have you read more uh, and maybe talk about the work that you did with the uh, Peace Collective um, walking patrols around Chinatown uh, in response to the anti-Asian violence. Um, okay, so um, next is Venus uh, Zathora Noble. And she has two pieces in the book. I wish that we had the time for her to read her longer piece, but I said that we were gonna be running out of time, Venus, so just read the poem, but gotcha. it's a powerful one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, so honored to be here. Thank you, Shiz, for just all you've done so far. Um, so I'll say something at the end. I'm not supposed to have an introduction. Living I B M, implicit bias and microaggression by Venus Zahora Noble. So my purse strap broke while dashing around the campus, 
I had a presentation in an hour or so. Why of all days did this have to happen? Up from the quad, I hustled with my backpack in tow, going to the mall next door. I ran across several people I didn't actually know. As I hurried past the library, a classmate noticed that I had blown out the curls in my hair. She reached toward me to touch my mane. I shook my head thinking, this child is so unaware. I took a shortcut by the business building where a group of white males were in conversation. Asians are all smart. Let's ask one of them to help with our project. I was sickened when all of them nodded with confirmation. Finally, I reached the department store. The door was about to close in the elevator. A little old white lady moved to the corner and clutched her bag as if I were a murderous perpetrator. On this short trek of a few short blocks, I experienced bias and microaggression. <sighs> Black and brown bodies living IBM, beholding the disease of covert oppression. Stereotypical thoughts and feelings that many are not, that many people are unaware of. Dismantles tolerance and connection, extinguishing the ability to love. I'm absolutely fed up with so-called colorblind displacement, all of the insidious denial that non-whites overlook regarding the irrationality of racists. I hear that I am different. I'm a credit to my race, articulate and blessed above measure. Covert insults are thrown consistently in my face. I recounted and re-encountered the classmate that tried to touch me. She received my burning glare. How ignorant of her to assume it was a compliment. I sharply checked her. Do not ever touch my hair. Thank you. Now you can figure out if this actually really happened. <laughs> Thank you for being among so much wonderfulness tonight and amazing giants. And sorry for uh, misspelling and mispronouncing your middle name, Venus. <laughs> I was too tired to double check it. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, Kevin, could you do me a favor and put in the chat the uh, where they can um, get the book online? It's uh, www.sf.com, endangered, uh, I think it's hyphen truths, and, sorry, essential hyphen truths. <laughs> Endangered Species was another anthology. Anyway, uh, yeah, please buy the book. Please help get it into schools and libraries. Uh, you know, I, I do these books because these are the kind of books that I needed to have around when I was a teenager. So, or a college student. Um, and maybe I wouldn't have dropped out of college if I had more access to books like this. Anyway, uh, so, um, we're coming up on the last reader, Yeva Johnson. Thank you, Shiz. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here. I'm very honored to be in the anthology. I have two short poems and I'm gonna do it my usual way for those of you who know me with a little music before and after. <laughs> Incantation for Black lives to remain in focus after the outrage fades. With gratitude to community of writers and the BIPOC writing communities, Carrie Marr. Oh, wise one, we call on your essence. We cleave to justice, but find only feather pillows after the owl's flight, a shifting enemy we seek 
O oh mother, a path to prevent more deaths, more suffering. Let not our heart's desires immolate on scattered alliances fanned by misbegotten echoes of promises already broken. This time, let the sword strike at the root to end this senseless cycle. And this one is wish list for the other side. When we are all vaccinated or immune, I'm going to book a massage at the Kabuki because Osento is closed. I want to feel someone's hands touch my whole body before I soak. When we are all vaccinated or immune, I'm going to Alamany Farmer's Market for corn and dry farm early girl tomatoes. I want to eat food that I picked out myself on the same day it was plucked. When we are all vaccinated or immune, I'm going to catch a flick at the Balboa or the Castro or a play at the Marsh. I want communal shared disbelief, laughing or crying in the dark next to strangers. When we are all vaccinated or immune, I'm going to visit my children in person at home in San Francisco or in their dorm rooms. I want to hold them, hug them, kiss them and repeat and repeat and repeat. When we are all vaccinated or immune, I'm going to throw an immune compromised person's post isolation party. I want to invite all the poets, writers, and friends who helped me survive. Thank you, and thank you, Shaz. Thank you, Yeva. Thank you for, to all the fabulous readers. Um, you were all amazing. Um, and uh, come to the uh, Oakland Asian Cultural Center uh, virtual reading on July 22nd. We'll have another whole different, completely different slate of 15 um, writers and artists, and they will be just as amazing. Avacha, uh, Karen Sinefru, um, Susana Prever Prever Perez, uh, Tonia Alderondo, um, uh, Wanda Sabir, um, just another amazing lineup of people. And for all of you who contributed. Uh, yeah, I, you know, because uh, you and I, I think a lot of people were in the visual, you know, we weren't doing the video part. Right. And um, I did see her. Um, Anyway, uh, and to those of you who contributed who haven't had a chance to read yet, please, if you can help me organize some readings, I'd really appreciate it because there's so many great people in the book and I am dog tired right now. I, I need a break from organizing. So any of those, uh, any of you out there, um, you know, Carol, Rupa, um, uh, any of you, um, uh, that want to help, uh, you know, set up some readings, please. Um, I could use the help. And there, there are some wonderful voices that still need to be heard. Susan Dambroff. Um, uh, let's see, who else is out there? Oh, Yosh Bokura. Um, it's so good to see you. Um, anyway, so it, this is the end of the program. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to just... Pretend that we're we're at the auditorium, and I'm going to cruise around and say hello to my friends. Here. I unmuted Later. everyone if they want to, you know, do action. Yeah, please unmute yourselves, talk to each other. gallery. Thank you. This was occasion. Amazing. Thank Love you. Everybody. Everyone Amazing. is so beautiful. Good to see you.